Thank you, Missy. Thank you, praise team. I stand by my previously expressed premise that God is doing something with First Baptist Church in Middletown. I believe he's here and active and among us. Something's going on and it's exciting to see. And the person we can blame is the Holy Spirit because there is, the Holy Spirit is moving in this church. Um, this morning, the title of my sermon is, uh, it's the third sermon in my sermon series, Getting Along. And the title of the sermon this morning is Living with Conviction. And it's a double meaning there on purpose. Living and forming your own convictions and also living with convictions of others. If you have your Bibles, our passage is going to be from Romans chapter 14. I will not be sharing the whole passage with you, with you this morning, but the entire chapter does talk about this as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So after the sermon this morning, if you want more study on your own on this topic, uh, you might want to follow up on those passages yourself. No matter how hard we try, we just can't seem to shed our need to live by law rather than by grace. A 2013 article in the Wall Street Journal explored the new wave of gadgets that will remind or cajole or pressure or threaten, judge or even nag us about what we're supposed to do and how to punish ourselves when we fall short. For instance, there's this new smart utensil called a happy fork. And I have a picture of it up here. It measures how fast you eat while it prods you to slow down and chew. I know I need this one. A company called Automatic offers a device that will chirp when a driver speeds, slams on the brakes, or does other things behind the wheel uh, that your mother probably wouldn't like. For $50, you can buy a toothbrush that wirelessly tells the phone app how often and how long you brush your teeth. This phone app sends the user rewards and punishments based on brushing behavior. And all parents of kids who don't want to brush their teeth could use that, right? A webcam software program called Posture Track, and they actually have a, a newer device, I have it pictured up here that you can wear at the base of your neck. It will catch you slouching. And there's also a website called BeeMinder with tally fines for undesirable behaviors like not flossing or staying up too late. One device user said that the digital nagging can, quote, kind of run your life, quote. Another user said, it's now possible to have a device in the background of your life recording everything you do. Does that sound appealing to anybody here? It does not sound appealing to me. Why can't we get a hold of ourselves? Why do, I, you know, with me, I don't know if you've realized the, the sin that punishes me, but I like to eat sweets. <laughs> and I can't stop myself. I joke with my daughter, I says, you need to, I call it heroin. I, you need to hide the heroin. Don't bring it in the house because it's addictive to me, right? And we can't seem to control our behavior. But when we find something about which we feel really strongly that this is the way we need to behave, we don't seem to have a problem following that, do we? And that's a conviction. As a matter of fact, let's talk just for a moment about what is a conviction. Um, we're not talking about when you feel convicted. That's something else entirely. For a Christian, when we develop convictions, it means we're talking about uh, something that, for which we feel strongly. We may even feel so strongly that we might feel the behavior is a sin, but it's not necessarily directly called a sin in Scripture. Perhaps it, it might be better to emphasize uh, a, what a conviction is by talking about what's not a conviction. There's a quote I've had for three weeks, and I knew it would find a place in one of these sermons. This is not a conviction. This quote says, if you must make a choice between heresy and schism, that is division, always choose heresy. Now what's surprising about this quote is it was said by a leader of a denomination in churches, Pastor Peter James Lee, one of 60 Episcopal bishops who voted to approve the appointment of Gene Robinson, an open, openly gay man, as the Bishop of New Hampshire. That's what a conviction is not. Why? Because he voted, openly saying he voted for heresy, knowing that the Bible directly condemns the behavior which they were approving. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about a conviction. What we're talking about when we talk about a conviction is one of those gray areas that Scripture does not address specifically. And I'm going to share a couple of these 
uh, from modern context a little bit later on in the sermon. That's what we're talking about. You see, we say that the Bible, we preachers say, and I hope that you say the same, the Bible has all the answers for everything you ever need in life. And that's true. But that does not mean it goes into excruciating detail, pinpointing every moment in life. There are things in the Bible that are directly called sin. But other than that, there are principles laid down in Scripture with which we need to follow, and they will help guide us. And this passage today in Romans chapter 14 will guide us through this. We're going to read just the first four verses and then the, uh, a few verses from the middle of the passage. So we're going to share from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 4 and 13 through 18. Would you stand with me, please, in reverence to God's holy word? Reading from the New International Version. Paul says, Accept the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Now, moving down to verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. May God richly bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we need to know how to get along with one another. And chiefly in this sermon this morning, we need to know how to get along with one another when we disagree. Even to the point when we disagree so strongly that one person might think the other person has sinned. When these convictions collide, Lord, help us to understand this. Help us to follow the principles of Scripture, Lord, and help us to be a loving church who is of one mind. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. You see, in this passage, we're talking about the idea of forming convictions. You feel so strongly about them, but then there's someone else in the church, someone who on many of topics, they're a fellow Christian, whom you disagree on this topic. How do you live with that person, work with them, minister with them, fellowship with them, and not let that get in the way of your relationship. This is really what Paul is talking about. We see, we talked about the topic of uh, not being judgmental a couple weeks ago, and this kind of follows very closely on the tails of this. We're, we're talking about how to deal with people when you just don't agree and you still need to work together. I've said before that everybody hearing my voice now is a volunteer, and just as we can volunteer... We can unvolunteer. And by the way, the same could be said of the leadership advisory board. And they are sticking through it. And, and you know, they volunteered to do this. And they're serving and they're being faithful. And I'm a uh, gentleman on that board. I applaud you for your faithfulness because I know it's a tough task. Anybody that can volunteer can unvolunteer. So how do we deal with each other when we disagree? We really need to know this. And there are just a, five different uh, verbs that I want to, words that I want to highlight in this passage for you so that we can talk about these. Now, I'm going to be diving a little bit into the Greek 
I'm going to try not to go too far into the weeds, but I feel like when we understand how these words were used and how they translate, it might help us a little bit better. So I've got a, a slide that's going to highlight them. There we go. The front and back screens, pardon me if this, are not always synced, but they're synced now perfect. Notice the words I have highlighted here. Accept, and then I have highlighted weakness, and then I have highlighted disputable matters, then I have highlighted treat with contempt and judge. So let's just walk through these and see what Paul is talking about. He starts off talking about how we need to accept the one whose faith is weak. Now, it's not like at work, where you have people you disagree with at work. You say, I just have to accept them. We just have to learn to get along and not agree. That is not the word Paul is using here. The, Paul, the word that Paul is using for accept means to take as one's companion, take one unto oneself. It's not a passive form of acceptance. Actually, the, the, the dictionary I used said it's aggressive, aggressively receive them. This is make a close bosom friend of someone that you don't agree with. Now, let's just pause in the sermon right there and say, okay, fine, let's do that. We'll have the invitation, we'll go forth, and we'll all do that. And you know what would happen? We would transform all the churches in America overnight, wouldn't we? If we just learn to really love, really embrace as friends, as brothers and sisters, people who we don't agree with, even Christians who we don't agree with, it would transform the church. But that's what Paul's talking about here. But notice who he says to accept. The second word is weak. Now this, I'm sorry, I love the NIV, but this is an unfortunate translation. Accept the person is weak. Yeah, sure, they're weak. What does that do automatically? That makes us feel like, oh, we're better than them, doesn't it? The word weak here literally means without strength. And see, here's the problem in the way that we read this with our modern eyes. I can accept that person who's weak. Well, let's, let's, let's see if we can pray a little. We're going to call three people. I don't know if I'm going to use all three, but Abraham and Benjamin. A, B, and then we're going to use probably Chad for the third one. Abraham, Benjamin, and Chad, A, B, C, all right? Abraham has this conviction that he feels really strongly about. Benjamin could care less about that conviction that Abraham feels about. So in Benjamin's eyes, Abraham is weak. And so it sounds like Paul is saying, accept, Benjamin, you accept Abraham because he's weak. Weak mind, weak willed, however you want to view it. Well, the, the problem is, just as Abraham has a conviction where Benjamin would perceive him as weak, Benjamin would have a conviction where Abraham would perceive him as weak. When we talk about someone being weak in this, we need to think we're not talking about just one person being weak. We all have convictions where other people would feel we are weak. Now, what is this person weak about? Perhaps if we hear what they're weak about, we can put it in better perspective. And I love the word that, Paul, uh, that the NIV uses here, in contrast with the use of the word weak. The, the NIV uses the word disputable matters. Don't argue over disputable matters. That's a great way of putting it. The Greek word here means reason. The Greek transliteration is the word reasoning. It means that deep inner reasoning or something that needs to be deliberated about. Something that's really a deep de deliberating subject. Like one for some Christians, and this is not one of the examples I'm going to use later on, how was the world actually created in seven calendar days? Was it seven days that each day was a thousand years? And, we, and if you really get into that, you really got to ponder and think about it and deliberate on it. That's what it's talking about. Well, we're talking about subjects where people deliberate on them and one person would conclude, no, I can't do this, or no, this is a sin, or no, this is not a sin. These gray areas that we really need to dig into, that's what Paul's talking about here. So where you're Benjamin and you see Abraham is weak, you need to accept him, even though you don't agree with his conviction. 
and where you're Abraham and you view Benjamin and you think he does something he shouldn't because that's your conviction, you need not to judge him either. And, and, and Paul even goes into detail, and I love the fact he uses two different Greek words for this, on how we're actually supposed to treat them. The person who um, is, feels that they are, you know, they can do something that the person with conviction can't, the person with, uh, you know, where Benjamin feels, doesn't care about it, and Abraham is viewed as weak, Benjamin tends to treat him with contempt. Treat him as nothing. That's what the Greek word there says. Cast out as nothing is the Greek word there, and I'm not going to pronounce the Greek word. Just look down on him and think of him as less. He's a lesser Christian because he feels he can't do that, and my conscience is clear when I do it, so I'm better than him. It's that I'm a better Christian than you are competition that some Christians have. You don't, you've never seen anybody with this competition, have you? Of course you have. Sometimes we even get caught up in it ourselves, don't we? And then the other side of that coin, where Abraham feels so strongly about that, he's considered the weaker brother. And he sees Benjamin as sinning because he does it. And Abraham feels, I just can't do that. It's a sin. He tends to look at Benjamin and say, that Benjamin, he's a reprobate Christian. He's a sinner because he's sinning on purpose. He's judging. That's the word that Paul uses there. And the, judge, the word for judgment there is the same word used for an official trial, to condemn. So that's what happens when we have these differences of convictions. One person looks down on the other person, or the other person judges and condemns the one who does the behavior. It's so easy to fall in that tendency, isn't it? Paul's saying, don't do either of those things, accept them. Because Paul knows at one moment in life you might be Benjamin, at another moment in life you might be Abraham. You could be the one being perceived as weak one moment, while you could be perceived as the one who's being strong the next moment. Now, what is this all about? Well, Paul actually gives two examples. And he gives what I will call a negative example and a positive example. And we didn't read all of those examples, but it was hinted at here. The, the negative example is example of food. Now, some scholars think this is talking about the, the Jewish admonition against eating clean and unclean food. Um, I tend more with the scholars that believe this is talking about more about food that was sacrificed to idols. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it talks about it a lot. So let me see if I can give a background. In the, in the pagan cities in modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, the, each city would have its own patron god, small g. And there would be temple worship at that temple in the city. And you could worship by going and paying a coin and having sex with the temple prostitutes. That was one way of worshiping. Another way of worshiping was obviously giving your money or giving your livestock to be sacrificed. And the livestock you give to be sacrificed to a god, and by the way, this is true, that one true god, and the worship in Jerusalem as well, is you have to give the best of the flock. So that meat that would be then butchered and then sold for a profit by the temple would be the best cuts available. It would be the filet mignon. So imagine going to someone's house and they set a fine plate of food and meat before you and they say, oh, isn't it wonderful food? I got this at the temple market. This had been sacrificed to Aphrodite. What if you had come to Christianity from the worship of Aphrodite? How would you feel? I'm sorry, I can't eat this, might be your response. Why? Because I know what happens in that temple doesn't glorify God, and I in good conscience can't eat this food. That person in this example would be the weaker person. But you can't blame them for coming out of that pagan worship and feeling, I can't do this because it's where I came from. I understand what these people who do this believe, and I have, and I have to set myself apart and demonstrate that I believe differently. I can't eat this meat. That's the weaker person in this example. That's the negative example. One person who maybe came from the Jewish background was like, meat is meat. It's good meat. I'm going to eat it. One person who came from the worship of background of Aphrodite would say, I'm sorry. I can't eat that meat. 
And it bothers me to see you eating it because I know what went into that. That's an example of a conviction that Paul is talking about. Can you see the conflict in the church? We have these conflicts today over other topics. Another of the examples that Paul used was the the example of days. One person treats every day the same. Another person treats certain days as special. And I think that's a more positive example. By positive, I mean the people who felt strongly for that conviction felt that there was something you should do. That's the positive example. Whereas opposed to the example of food was the people who felt a strong conviction was something you should not do. And that's what I mean by positive and negative. And I think this example might be the Jews who came to Christianity from Judaism celebrated the seven feasts of the year. You know, the Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Yom Kippur, the Feast of Passover. And after they came to Christianity, they probably did not stop celebrating those feasts because those were ordained by God in the Old Testament. And once again, who can blame them? It's not only part of their spiritual heritage, but it's part of their cultural heritage. And whereas the pagans would say, well, yeah, I really don't care about Yom Kippur. You can do that if you want. But I don't feel strongly that I need to do that. That's a conviction. And you know what? Which one of them is right? They both are. That's the thing about convictions. It is possible for both people on the side of the convictions to be right. Because they're gray areas in Scripture. There is an overriding principle that Paul gives. And it's in 1 Corinthians 8, 9. And it's simply this. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights, in other words, the freedom you feel to do what you need to do because of your convictions, does not become a stumbling block to the weak. That Jewish person who felt it's okay to eat the food of the temple should not rub into the face of the person who came from the worship of Aphrodite. You know what? I eat that meat and you don't. You're a weak Christian. Don't rub it in their face. That's what it means. That's what Paul means. So those are the Old Testament or the, the New Testament examples, you know, from antiquity. There are three examples that I want to share with you here at the end of the sermon that are modern examples. And there's more I'm sure that you could give me. One of them is an example where in many churches it's split right down the middle. Half would have a conviction on this side and half would have a conviction over here. Another one is a conviction where probably the majority of Christians in any given conservative Baptist church would agree with this conviction. And the third one is the one where the majority of Christians in any given Southern Baptist church in America would probably disagree with this conviction. So there's one right down the middle, one where most agree, one where most disagree. I'm going to let you decide over lunch which one you think is which. I'm not going to tell you which one I think is which. So let's start with the first one, Halloween. The celebration of Halloween in some Christian households is a very tender issue. Some Christians believe that Halloween is a pagan uh, occult-emphasized holiday, and, and they see the obsession on the occult in our culture, and they feel in good conscience, I can't participate in Halloween, and I can't have my family participate in that. It's why centuries ago, uh, the church created the holiday of All Saints Day on November 1st, and the, the celebration of All Hallows' Eve on October 31st, to combat that pagan celebration by the Druids. And so some Christians feel they have a strong conviction, I can't celebrate Halloween. And there are other Christians who look forward to dressing their kids up and taking them out trick-or-treating. This is a place where Christians, in good conscience, can disagree and still love each other as brothers and sisters. Where the one who takes their children out trick-or-treating should not see as weak the one who says, no, I can't do that. And the one who, sa- who feels, I can't celebrate Halloween, should not judge the one who takes their kids trick-or-treating as being a sinner. That's what Paul is saying here. The next example is probably a more common example, drinking alcohol. There are Christians who believe alcohol should never pass the lips of a Christian. It is an evil vice. And they'll even try to point to the Bible to say, the Bible says you should never drink any alcohol. But then the people who say, well, wait a minute, what does the Bible really say? Would say, the Bible condemns drunkenness, but Jesus drank wine. 
And Paul even tells Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach. And Paul says, let your moderation be known to all, in, in all things, let your moderation be known. So it's not the drinking of alcohol that the Bible condemns, it's being drunk. See, I'm saying it's shaking yes with both sides of this. You don't even realize you're doing it. And, you know, the truth is, there are devout Christians on both sides of this issue who have strong convictions. And I dare say, if we took a church vote on it right now, it would be a very divisive issue if we were to do that. So what's the truth? Who's right? There are some people for whom drinking alcohol is a sin. My mother and her generation was one of them. Grew up just after Prohibition, and for her, alcohol was always evil. She felt very strongly about it. I would have never, ever even attempted to talk my mother out of that. But I know Christians, devout Christians, who have an occasional glass of wine or a mixed drink. It's an area of conviction. And we need to learn to accept and love and embrace those who disagree with it. And then the final one is one that's a little bit a little bit more closed down, a little bit more narrow. Going to movies. Now, notice I didn't say going to R-rated movies. There are some people who say, a Christian should never go to an R-rated movie. And then Abraham over here would say, well, wait a minute, The Passion of Christ was a great movie, but it was rated R. Are you going to miss that one too? I have family members who, for years, didn't have a television in their home at all. That's just the way they were. And in the last few years, they've gotten a television. They watch occasionally. And they go to occasional movies now. And they have a strong conviction, and I kid you not, they have a strong conviction they can never go to a single movie that has a single cuss word in it. Now, you think about everything that's put out by Hollywood, and even the most generic PG movie has got at least one cuss word in it, right? So they can't go, to, like, for instance, Beverly and I, about a month ago, and you may judge us for, for this, I'm sorry if I've, uh, I've fallen for grace in your eyes, but Beverly and I binged the entire series of Downton Abbey just so we could go to the movie and watch Downton Abbey. And we went to, and loved it. And I thought it was a very uplifting, for the most part, moral movie, but it's got some things in it that I don't agree with. And my relatives could never go to that movie because of those few things in it that I don't agree with. You know, some people feel strongly about that. But Bev and I, we love to go to movies. I'm going to tell you right now, that's one of, we're going to a great movie this afternoon that we're going to watch. Some Christians feel you shouldn't go to those R-rated movies, or you shouldn't go to those movies that have any customers. Well, what's the right answer? Once again, that's another place of strong convictions. So, what's the bottom line? Well, let me tell you a story. If I can get my... There we go. Let me tell you a story in closing. Imagine a surgical nurse fresh out of school on her first day in the OR. A true story. In the operating room of a large, well-known hospital, it was the surgical nurse's first day on the medical team. And she was responsible for ensuring that all instruments and all materials were accounted for before completing the final steps for the operation. She said, as the operation came to a close, to the surgeon, you've only removed 11 sponges. We used 12 sponges. We need to find the last one. The surgeon looks at her and says, I removed them all. He declared it emphatically. We will close the incision now. No, the rookie nurse objected. We use 12 sponges. I will take responsibility, the surgeon said grimly. Suture. You can't do that, sir, blazed the nurse. Think of the patient. The surgeon looked at the nurse paused, smiled, and lifted his foot to reveal the 12th sponge. He had been testing her. And then he replied, you will do just fine in this hospital or any other hospital. She passed his test. But during, she would never have known. What did that young woman do? She stuck to her convictions, even in the face of overwhelming oppression. I'm not telling you change any of your convictions. As a matter of fact, I'm telling you whatever you feel strongly about, feel strongly about. Be who you are, but find a way to love everyone else who is just being who they are. Amen? Amen? Stand, please. Heavenly Father, 
teach us to live with conviction in the sense that we develop our own convictions through prayer and through deliberation like this word says and we decide this is what I believe and then we move forward with that. But also, Lord, in the sense of we see someone else who is a brother or sister in this church who feels differently about the same subject and we love and embrace them anyway. We do not demand they come to our way of thinking, Lord. We take them as our loyal companion and love them, even though we disagree. Sometimes, Lord, each of us is the weaker brother, and sometimes each of us is a stronger brother. Help us to learn to love no matter which role we are in our relationships at any one moment. Make this church, our church, our home church that we love, a people of one mind and one spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.